So, first of all, thank you everyone for coming out. Um, this is the first of our so winter social evenings, and a special welcome to a couple of new members. The new members here. I won't embarrass you by asking you to stand up and tell us about yourselves. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> no, welcome, guys. Uh, it's lovely to see you here, and uh, hope to see a lot of you on the hill. Um, just a bit of club business before we get going on the. Uh, business of the night. Some future events. Uh, next month we have Richard Meek booked uh, coming to tell us all about his uh, epic times flying everywhere and all over the world and at the sharp end of paragliding. Uh, always entertaining Richard so I'm sure that will be a big turnout so get here early on that. Not to be missed. <coughs> We're also looking at um, sorry I'll Cancel that for a minute. Uh, we're looking at exploring sites further afield. Where can you go within two hours of here? You know, places to, to look at and consider, you know, not just focusing on Parlick and Pendle. Um, reserve repack, Barry has agreed, is very happy to do another reserve repack for us over the winter. So I've just asked him to get some more details together for that. He hasn't replied to me as yet. So I don't know when that's going to be. Sorry, I'm just checking to see if he's replied in the meantime. No, okay. So that will happen. Keep it, keep an eye on the social media and on the website to see when we're going to do the reserve read pack. There will also be a first aid course. Now, we're in negotiations, discussions as to what exactly what format that would take. So what we're going to do is canvas opinions um, from people. It's something that requires a bit of a financial commitment. So we'll need to know in advance how many people are really interested in doing and what level of course they're interested in doing. So again, watch out, watch your emails and uh, make sure you've got them. If you guys sent your emails and addresses in to the membership secretary, I hope so, because uh, it can all, it, it all go out. Did, did you get it to work? I didn't get it to work, no. I'm going to try again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so th that will be coming out later on. Uh, there's the Christmas and New Year do. Something will happen on that on those lines uh, as long as somebody gets around to doing something about it. Uh, there are various people who get involved in something like that. Um, I'm not pointing at anybody in the room. <laughs> he usually does something about, about it every year. Um, the sorry, first aid course then, it will happen, but we'll canvas opinions on it and uh, do that. As always, if you, the members, want us to do something or think there's something that we should be putting on, tell us. Say so, you know, or offer to do it. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be done by a committee member. Any one of you can say, oh, I've got a good idea for a club night out or a day trip somewhere, a visit somewhere, the Spitfire hangar at Blackpool or something like that. Just suggest it. We can do anything like that. Okay, so. Can I yeah. just add that um, it's not, nothing's been organised yet, but. Hopefully we'll do some pilot revision nights during the winter yes, as well. Of course, yes. And if anybody's got the tasks or most of the tasks done for the pilot rating, then just send me a message or an email or something. But I'll, I'll send some out on the groups and maybe by email. Yeah, we'll definitely do something on that again this year. For, for anybody who needs it, however few or however many there are, yeah, we'll do that. So. We're talking weather forecasts. We're just trying to help you to make sense of the information that's out there. Whether you're an old season grizzled past it pilot like me, or you're brand new to this game, uh, there's something we can all learn about how to do this. So we'll cover where to look for forecasts, how to use them, what sense to make of them, look at their advantages and their disadvantages, the drawbacks, and we'll have a discussion about them. I think that's possibly the most important part of the evening, is discussing and sharing information and ideas that we've got on how to do these things. It's not about how to forecast the weather, but I want to start you thinking about making the best use of the resources that we've got out there. And I'm pleased to say that we've invited the, the top paragliding weather experts in the country to come and present this to you. Unfortunately, they couldn't come, so you've got us. So. 
that's all we've got. So, I'll start with RASP. We all use RASP, don't we? I think. Yeah. Just about everybody uses RASP. You guys know about RASP? I've heard of it. You've heard of it? Oh, well, it's okay. Well, pin your ears back and listen in. It's not a talk on how to make weather forecasts. It's just looking at the resources that are out there. And I'm going to look at some of the less used features of RASP, uh, the ones that I found useful recently. I mean, we, we all know how to do these, don't we? These are easy, aren't they? You, know, you, take, the, you take the dry adiabatic lapse rate, you extrapolate it back to meet the, the, the temperature isotherm, you multiply by the relative humidity, and subtract your inside leg measurement, and it doesn't work, does it? I've got no idea. Every year I sit down in the toilet with Dennis Pages, I mean Dennis Pagan's book on weather forecasting. And I learn this stuff. And then a month later I look at I look at a skew here and I think, oh what does that mean again? I've got no idea. I do use it. I look at this. I find this fascinating. How the wind speed changes and the wind direction changes with height. It's very, very useful. You're looking for wind shear, you're looking for sharp gradients, sharp changes in the wind speed in this little layer here, up to about 4,000 feet. Big changes, big changes in speed. Here we're going from about 15 knots to 30 knots before you get to the top of Parliament. So you wouldn't go flying in that. But it's, uh, it's, use, it's a useful guide as to what's going on. This stuff here tells you whether it's going to be cloudy and at what level. But the nice people at RASP have done a lot of work interpreting this. And they produce pages and pages and pages which extract the data that they've got and present it in a more meaningful form. So it would be rude not to use their expertise in order to do this. And most of RASP, we all look at the star rating. That's probably the first thing people look at. When they go to RASP, what's the star rating? and it's got a colour coded chart and this is a constant, the colour coding is never changes red is five stars, amber four stars, yellow three stars, green two stars etc down to blue so that's always constant and this is a typical picture for this whole country, for this country great conditions south of Birmingham, crap up here but that's, you know, that's the way it is, if you want better flying move the, is the message from that. But that's the basic, one of the basic pages. Boundary layer average wind. It's, it is what it says on the tin, shows you the wind speeds and if you, if you, you, you guys at this look at this, if you right click anywhere on, the, on, on here, it will give you the actual value at that point, at that particular time of the day. You, can, you see it at different times of the day. So you can get spot data for anywhere. The colour coding for this chart and others changes according to the range of values that's on display. So you have to look at the colour code at the same time as you look at the picture, just to make sure that you're not looking, you're not using yesterday's colour code for today's chart. The only, well, the bound, there is one bound, the one boundary layer that we fly in. Is, and it varies from zero to 10,000 feet. It just depends on what's happening on the day. I'm going to talk about the boundary layer in a minute when we get to one of the other pages. Uh, thermal updraft velocity, again, it's as described, gives you colour coded pictures, and again, you can right click on that in order to get the figures, that, the values that you want for the day. Uh, star rating, of course, is it's a conglomerate thing of thermal updraft velocity, wind speed, cloud-based height, boundary layer depth, all sorts of things put in together, and it's a crude estimate of is it going to be flyable, how good is it going to be on a particular day. A lot of, a lot of people use the star rating. It, it's optimised for gliders, which of course fly much faster than we do, but a lot of people use that as a first look, and then look at the boundary layer wind speed, and say, oh yeah, it might be fantastic thermals, but the wind speeds are going to be off the clock. So, great for gliding, not so great for foot launching. Um, well, as we say, yeah, and cloud base, again, useful to know where your thermals are going to end up. 
But it's it's a lot of clicking. It's a lot of looking around. You that is a picture for one time of the day. So you've got to look at different times of the day on each on each chart. And what I'm moving towards is how you can combine all of this together on one page and glance at it all the way through. So how about these ones? Buoyancy shear ratio, BS ratio. This is looking at a comparison between the buoyancy of the air, how, how fast the thermals are rising, and the wind shear. And the wind shear here they're talking about is the change in wind speed and or direction with height. So if the wind's constant in speed and direction all the way up to the top of the boundary layer, then the buoyancy shear ratio will be 10 because the buoyancy is maximum and the wind shear value is zero. If the wind's changing by dramatic amounts in direction or speed, then the buoyancy shear ratio would be very low compared, even if, even if it's a very buoyant day, if you've got a lot of wind shear, that's going to break the thermals up and make them very, unu very hard to use. Glider pilots use a value of about five to indicate whether the thermals are going to be easy to use or too broken up to be used. Paraglider pilots can probably use point BS ratios below five because we can turn in smaller circles and so if the thermals are breaking up into bits but there's usable bits, we can use them. But the low figures for, for point to shear ratio usually mean not a very good day for us and potentially quite a rough and unpleasant day. Very much worth having a, having a look at that as part of your, your planning. Um, and say about that. It's based on dry thermals, based on thermals which are purely driven by the ground heating. As you get closer to cloud base, if there are significant clouds, then cloud soft will increase the buoyancy as you get closer and that will improve the buoyancy shear ratio. So some, sometimes you find that things get better as you get closer to cloud base. Sometimes they get worse, so uh, that, that, that's another story. You're looking for five and above. You're looking for five and above, yes. You're looking, you're looking for values up there. It's not so much that that would make a great day, it's just that these low values here, you might think, oh, it's going to be really thermic, it's not that windy at the ground, but if the, point, if the BS ratio is down here, you've got to find that great thermal that you take off the hill breaks up and, sh and scatters into different, different bits all over the place. It just makes it hard to use. Or you might find that it's a very rough, rough edge thermal. You part way around it, you're dipping into sink and then back into it just because it's been broken up by the wind shear. And it really doesn't matter whether it's a, a change in speed with height or a change in direction. Both of those are factored into those into that. Convergence. Boundary layer maximum up and down motion. It can be very, very useful. The yellow lines here indicate something like 300 feet per minute, 1.5 1, 1. meters per second vertical pop, which is you know, significant enough to give you a very good glide. You know, so if you could glide along one of these tracks, you know, you've got a very good chance of making a lot of distance. I have used this, noticed a couple of times that my two best flights this year ended up in a convergence line from, from Parlick out towards, um, towards Malham, out this direction. And it was a very obvious, very clear convergence line that we could surf along the side of because the, the wind was, was right, the, the lift was rising much higher than the cloud base because of that convergence. I didn't know about it in advance. It was only a case of looking at the maps afterwards and thinking, oh yeah, that's why it was such a good, good direction that, that day. It's worth looking at in advance. And CAPE, Convective Available Potential Energy. Thunderstorms. <laughs> it, again, it's a movable scale. You could have values up here of 5,000 or something like that. It always goes down to zero. Zero to 300 
don't worry about it. I guess I'm going to thunderstorm. 1,000 to 2,000, yeah, localized, isolated thunderstorms. Anything above 2,000, it's going to be banging. Serious, uh, serious QNMs. So you can see here that you know most of Norfolk is going to have a lot of thunderstorms that day, whereas outside of the country, no, no risk. Again, worth looking at. Something that uh, that can that can jump out at you. Again, you might be thinking, oh, sunk in thermos today. Good, good wind speed. Everything's going good. I'm going to get out on there and do 200 kilometres until you see that where you're heading might be straight into QNM country. So, another useful one to look at. Now, the thing is with all of these, they're valid for a specific time. <coughs> so, this is the 10 o'clock British summertime star forecast for our base of the country. And you have to step through it to see how the day develops, which can give you lots of useful clues. Go back to 12 o'clock midday. Now, part of the country. Ooh, nice. Four stars, three, four stars. Where we are, could be, could be really good. But the next hour starts to tell you, yeah, you've got to get going early because all of this one or zero stars here. What's that? Sea breeze. Sea air pushing in, in, in down here spoiling the day at Palmer. Um, this is a regular event. Um, this is June, and this is quite typical that by, by two o'clock in the afternoon, the sea breeze has come in and changed the day completely. It might start the thermals going. It might also just kill everything off until later on in the afternoon. But you have to go clicking through these one hour at a time and keep in your mind what's going on. So you can just see one parameter at a time, and one snapshot at a time. But there is another way. How many people use Blipspot? Mm. Well, a few of you. Again, it's just one of the parameters, one of the pages on RASP. And what you get is a complete table of everything that's going on in the day. The first one, you've got the boundary layer top, is the green line. It's going all, all over the place that day. So that tells you where the boundary layer is. You've got all of that. You've got the thermal height in blue. 1,500 feet. Mm. I'm almost getting out of bed for probably. The height of the critical updraft. Not quite the same thing, but more or less. Cloud base. And the thermal strength indicated down here in feet per minute. So. 200 feet per minute maximum, not very much at all. Then you get the temperature, you get the surface temperature in red, and the dew point in blue. Wind speed, the surface wind speed in red, purple, and the upper, up, the boundary level, upper layer wind speed in green. And that will be the wind speed at whatever top of the boundary layer or the average during that during that period in there. Sorry, that's the top of the that's the top of the boundary layer. So that's the maximum wind speed you can expect if you climb to the top of the boundary layer. Then you've got the wind direction in degrees along there, how it's changing. Cumulative poten cumulus potential. Look it up. <laughs> I'm never quite sure what exactly it means. Variable surface sun. Oh, sorry, normalized surface, surface sun as a percentage of how much energy is reaching the ground. And rainfall and star rating as it changes through the day. So on one page, you've got almost all the parameters that you need to look at. Wind speeds, the thermal strength, the thermal heights, boundary layer levels, wind directions, star rating. It's all there laid out on one page. You've got to read the, read the graphs, read the axes, but it's all there. Quite a bit easier than um, looking at different pages and trying to remember what one page said compared to the other one. But there's another slide, another page. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. What's that all about? Um, 
it's, I started to use these recently because it, it takes all of that data and puts it on one picture. Takes a bit of, takes a bit of sorting out. So let's see if we can break this down a little bit. Down the right hand side is an altitude scale in feet. Easy enough. Down the left hand side, sorry, is the pressure levels. Now that changes according to the surface pressure level on the day. But uh, typically, you know, it's about the ground level is going to be round about whatever the pressure is on that day. So that varies a little bit from day to day. <coughs> You've got on the bottom the time. So it covers the whole day, nine o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night. At the top, the vertical velocity, the thermal strength. So here we've got on this particular day, thermal strength, maximum thermal strength was up in the 300s for most of the middle part of the day, 12 o'clock until 3 o'clock, over 300 feet per second. Feet per minute, sorry. Then surface wind speed and direction. These little boxes down here, so down here we've got this one particular, it says 343, so that's the wind direction, just west of north, 13 in knots. Now, if I'm gonna moan about rust, it's the fact that they put these boxes here just where they obscure the wind arrows. So you can't quite see what the wind arrows are doing at the surface because these boxes cover them up. I don't know if they can do anything about that, but that's, uh, that's one, one of my gripes with this picture. The normalized surface sun, as I mentioned there, the percentage of the radiant energy reaching the ground. Not necessarily bright sunlight, but the amount of radiation that's getting down to the ground. Uh, there's, again, there's a page of descriptions of the parameters on there. If you want to go deeper into it, go and have a read of them. Uh, I'm a chartered physicist, and I don't get most of I get. I don't get it all, because they, the way they describe these parameters can't quite make sense to me. But anyway, I'm always a bit concerned as to how 100% of the sunlight can get through layers and layers of cloud. 100% cloud at that level. But it gives you an idea. You've got, you've got some idea of how much heat, it, it, it's the heat energy reaching the ground that we get on there. Then, the boundary layer. So we can see here that the boundary layer changes from about 4,000 feet above the ground at the beginning of the day, drops down below 2,000 feet straight away, and then slowly climbs up to about four, five and a half thousand feet, five thousand feet for the rest of the day before it drops away again. And that's the, that's the effect of the, the daily change in sun angle, sun, uh, sun energy through the day, uh, and more or less disappears at night. So that gives you where the boundary layer is. You also get symbols, nice little pretty pictures for where the clouds are. So there's a layer of high cloud at 15, 16,000 feet. And the boundary layer clouds, these are clouds, these are convective clouds, these are going to be the cumulus clouds that form within there. The temperature levels indicated by dotted lines here, and this one is minus 10 degrees temperature level. The freezing level is indicated by these nice snowflakes on there. So if you climb to the top of the boundary layer, you're going to need your gloves. The th thermaling heights, these little seagulls, indicate the top of the usable thermals. Rust calculates that 220 feet per minute is the, the sink rate of, the, of most gliders, and so anything less than 220 feet per minute isn't usable. And you can see here that we've got usable thermals up to 3,000 feet at three o'clock, and then it drops off to a thousand feet. So something, something changed, some dramatic change has happened to the weather in that case there. These give an indication of where you can expect the thermals to top out. Wind speed and direction, again, worth re learning how to read these barbs. 
the, these, these arrows, the little barbs, little barbs on them. Each long barb is ten knots. Each short barb is five knots. So that one there, four bar, four long and a short, that's 45 knots. A solid triangle is 50 knots. Clearly not paragliding where they're up there. Or even down here in the boundary layer, we've got huge wind speeds down here. And even at ground level, it's 13 knots, but one step up from there, and you've got 35 knots. So massive wind gradient, huge change in speed. It might feel oh, not too bad down at the ground here, Takeoff level, it's going to be horrendous. Anything else on that page? And <coughs> stability. How stable is the atmosphere going to be? Are you going to get thermals? Again, on this day, it was unstable all day. Right until, even down at ground level, right until late in the day. So the red colour indicates that it's unstable and ready for cooking thermals. Blue is inverted. No, no real inversions on this one, but uh, information in there. What's the big white space over there? The big white space over there is the, I'm not sure. Um, so that just a clear. There's something about down here. No, I can't see that. I'm not quite sure of what that, that shading and that white blob there is about. It probably is cloud at the top of the boundary layer, which is not included <coughs> in, the, in, the band, in the clouds within the boundary layer. Again, go and have a look. It was, it's 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 very cute, then. There's lots of internet. It could be, yeah, mm. but I'm not sure about That's above the freezing layer, so that's going to be, they're going to be ice clouds. Yeah, clouds of ice crystals, not, uh, not so much cumulus, not so much fluffy cumulus clouds. So, this was today. And I think we can see along there. Today was a blue day, wasn't it? Sunny all day, 100% normal ice surface sun. All day. Sorry? Not what we flew, it was more like the house. Well, there we go, six o'clock, overcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it might, might have got it a bit wrong, but uh, anyway, uh, no thermals after that. Thermal strength, 250 metres per second, uh, feet, per se feet per minute, sorry, one and a half metres per second. Did you find anything stronger than that? No. No, nothing sustained, nothing sustained. So it was about right in terms of thermal strength. Uh, wind speed at surface level, seven, six knots. And then jumping up to 10 to 15 at takeoff level, 20 knots, in fact, at um, 20 knots at, at um, higher than that. So 15 knots at takeoff level, probably about right. It's not far away. Not, I can't see much significant wind shear in there. The direction's fairly constant. Ground, the ground level wind speed shown here, it's hard to see it because it's hidden by the boxes. Thermal heights, 1,000 feet, 1,200 feet. Well, we got higher than that, didn't we? Yeah, not a lot. Not a lot, no. And there, and there wasn't really any chance to go any higher than that because it all, it all fizzled out. So, you know, give or take a few hundred feet. That was a quite a good prediction as well. Uh, a little bit of instability, but only up to 2,000 feet. So, not a bad, not a bad prediction really. Some cloud at that level. I think there was less than that myself but during the day. And then, like Neil said, we got a bit more cloud later on in the afternoon. So, but not too far away from from what actually happened. <coughs> Surprised that the freezing level was up at 10,000 feet. Good felt cold. Yeah. <coughs> Um, so that kind of, oh yeah, uh, I haven't got a slide for it, but the, the, the BS ratio today was two. So 
we got sick in place anyway. We got <laughs> we got tossed around a bit during 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 the afternoon. Did it get better later in the I day? don't think it did. I didn't look I didn't look into it that deeply. Yeah. Worth having a look perhaps before it before they closed down tonight. So but the, the thermals were hard to use, they were broken up because the buoyancy the buoyancy was low and the shear the shear wasn't particularly bad, except in terms of wind direction, wind change and speed, but that was that wasn't too bad. Um, that's about it. It's, you know, it's not about how to read that. It's just a bit, these are the things that are there. Uh, I've fallen in love with this. I think this is great. Can I ask oh. where that is? Because I've never seen that before. I've never seen that. Right. Just look at the headings on the top of the RAS page. I'll pull one up. There you go, along here, meteograms. And when you go to meteogram, you get... It, it works on turn points the same as blip spot. You get, you get you, well, you get a short list of turn points, which are basically the gliding club stations. Yeah. But there is also custom meteograms where you can put any, any turn point in. It takes a, two or three minutes to load it up because they build it, it builds it up from first principles. Okay. But the, uh, the, the the glider field turn points are all built, are all built in, so they load instantly. But, uh, <coughs> so that's where that is. Um, so blip spot is is there. Um, meteograms, cost of meteograms. If you don't know if you don't know the names of the turn points, which you won't, uh, the the BGA turn point map is here, and this gives you. Eventually, a list, of, a map of the country with all the uh, gliding British Gliding Association turn points and the three, three letter symbols for them. Chipping is CHP. Easy. Just uh, yeah. And so you get a decent sized map. You can have a look at that and CHP is ours. There aren't that many scattered around it. There are more of them in, in other parts of the country. But wherever you're going, you can find a turn point near you and get, get yourself a forecast for it. So that's, just, but that's become my favorite go-to now. Have a look at the meteogram, get a picture of the day, and then go on from there. Anybody else? Any more? You're on go. lazy rats. Sorry? You're on lazy rats. <laughs> I, I, that's, my, that's my daily. You, you start with daily. Yeah, it's a web graphic look at the forecast in the first place. And I think that's that, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've got I've got it automated. It's one of the pages that I open up, and I'll have a look through the week, yeah, see what's yeah, see what's right. coming up. And you, you, you spot a day on Lazy Rasp. Um, I've got it on here somewhere. Which parameters do you put up? Uh, star rating and uh, band layer width yeah. in, in dual form. Yeah. And you get each day of the week shown to you. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, it's looking, <laughs> <laughs> looking, at, looking <laughs> absolute <laughs> stonky week coming up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I no idea. Book the week off. Yeah, and then if anything's half these kind of then I think it's Yeah. Uh, that's not on the official RASP page, that's Lazy RASP. So if you don't know about Lazy RASP, go searching for Lazy RASP. That's another one. <laughs> anything else on RASP? What sorts of RASP? Uh, just the currents here a bit. that is that's one of my issues with RASP. I think that the data they use is a little bit old. I think they, they get their data for free. And so, therefore, it's released by the better the meteorological agencies after the after they've sold it to various agencies. Then it's there's a little bit of a delay, and then it's released to people like us. So, it's not the most up to date. Yeah, um, be aware of that. 
when you look in the office. There's an 18 hour forecast. Sorry? There's an 18 hour forecast. Refreshed every 18 hours. It refreshes, yeah. But does it use, is it refreshing with <coughs> data that's just arrived, or is yeah. it refreshing with data that, that <coughs> came in? Usually it, it tells you when the, it's worth checking the, the valid time and date yeah. stamp yeah. on it, because sometimes it's, it's one valid. of the charts is, will be out of date. Yeah. yeah, it says at the top there, it says valid, particularly on that one. I don't know if you can see. Yeah. It's valid, it, it, well, that, that's the time. The timestamp it's valid for that's for 1400 that's for 1200 mm. that's but that's 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 when that's that's when it's they've prepared the forecast yeah. for that time i think if you, if you look to the screenshots of your powerpoint i think uh had uh 13 minutes past midnight yes yeah. so, does that mean does, does that mean when it was I that's when it, was it runs, it yeah, runs twice it. a day doesn't it yeah <coughs> it's it, it's a matter of you know if, if they've used last week's data then they might have they might have run it now, yeah. but if they're using data from a week ago, I don't know how old it is. How and do they get the data? Though? Is it satellite or is it actually? It's, it, come, it comes from weather, weather, weather balloons. balloons. Yeah. Yeah. It comes it comes from the international weather forecasting people uh, who are a commercial organisation. So they mm. sell the data to all sorts of organisations like the BBC, like uh, mm. like any certain the. Uh, CAA will buy this data to create forecasts for, and the military will buy the data. And that data, if it's available free elsewhere, why would they buy it? So they're not going to buy stuff that, that we can get for free. So the free stuff that we get has got to be at least six hours out of date in my estimation. Now, I am told, and I've got no idea if it's true, that Windy actually buy the data fresh. As a, philanthropic, as a philanthropic gesture to pilots, because it's run by somebody who's got loads of money. I don't know if that's true. Well, Windy's got various different models that vary from yeah. sort of 12 hours down to 2 hours. Yeah. Yeah. You can pay for yeah. Windy as well. You can pay for Windy as well, but I don't know if you get any, any, I don't any, think you any get more data. I think, you just get I think you're just getting more features. And ad free. Yeah. You get features ad free and. Uh, See further. Yeah, I I pay for it. I think I think it's worth it. You get a bit more enhanced data and, and uh, a lot further afield. But I don't think you get anything fresher. I don't think it's newer data. But I think Windy's. I'm told that Windy's data is some of the most up to date that's available for free. Oh, okay. worth, worth checking out. Somebody's got uh, more info on that. I'd love to know which of the, which of these apps has the most uses the most recent data to make their forecasts. But I don't know how you find that out. But I've been talking for far too long. Do you want to follow me on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll have a beer. Mm -hmm. And then go from yeah. there. Right. You want I'm going to take it back a level. <laughs> <laughs> Not as. Uh... Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's probably a very good idea. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no. So yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to sort of take it back um, a bit of a level rate in terms of what my approach is to looking at the weather. Um, and also, I suppose, we, we were talking, weren't we, saying it's one of the most selfish sports because you never commit to anything, any family events or anything, just on the off chance that you might actually <coughs> go flying at the weekend or on a particular day. And I've wasted so much time, you know, not flying on days where I've said to the missus that oh, the kids, I'm, I'm, I'm going out flying and then it's, it's yeah. just not worked out. So I've, I've sort of, uh, I now sort of troll various websites to work out, you know, can I commit to flying this weekend? You know, I'm a weekend warrior. Um, or shall I take a day off work? So it's sort of, you know, what I look at. Um, and the first thing I look at, so there's a um, weather school. Some people in the room that have been around sort of paragliding a while or flying. Uh, Dr. Simon Keithling, he has weather school. And he does, uh, the first thing I do on a Monday morning, 7.30, he releases a YouTube video. And I'll show you today's actually. Um, 
And basically, it's a flying forecast, and it's sponsored by a number of flying sort of, um, I think it's Fly Magazine or Web.net. Web you still have to pay for it. No, no, it's all free. So, <coughs> so 7 30 on the morning. You started charging for this forecast, didn't you? Right. Because I, I stopped using it. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, but what it does do, it does uh, the flying forecast on a Monday morning, 7 30 releases it. And then that, and that's the week ahead and the weekend. And then it does the same on a Thursday, but it then just covers the weekend through to Monday when he then does his next one. And it's an overview. It's the whole of the UK, but it'll pretty much tell you what's coming coming up. And I'll I'll, I'll run it. In. Well, it's probably about three minutes, three minutes long, something like that. And that's the one from this morning. The other thing as well that he does is um, every Friday morning. I get a, an email, which is this one here. Can you see my? Well, you can't see my uh, Yeah. So it's this one here, and if you just send a blank email to General Weather, um, subscribe at weatherweb.net, you'll get this in your inbox every Friday morning, and it basically just gives a general sur summary of what's going on, all the fronts that are passing through, and, and things like that. And again, it does that for free. It comes in and it'll give you the Saturday and you'll see the Sunday one uh, down there as well. But again, it's just something that you can just look at quite differently. It's not worth even looking into all the data that Brian's gone through yeah. because it's just not worth going out or there might be a chance. Does he still charge for some of this one? Yeah, so he's got uh, weatherweb.net. Yeah. There's some free bits on there, but he has gone pretty much premium. Right, because I used to look at his video forecasts religiously every Yeah, well, the, the back free. So he started charging for them. Yeah, yeah, no, they're all back free now. And I, I'll run today's. The other one as well, and I've done this, I mean, quite a number of people in the room know it. I've also got a uh, sort of private pilot's license, so I fly uh, fixed wing. And through that, I've done um, his courses here. So he has Aviation Weather School Part 1, and it goes into some depth about all the, um, you know, the, the Met Office charts, SKUTs and things like that. Um, it is a bit expensive, it's like 250 quid for the course. But I tell you what, it, it's brilliant. It, it really puts the meat on the bones of the stuff that you do learn when you're doing your, uh, sort of, your CP stuff and beyond. It really puts the meat on the bones. The other one he does do as well, and I've done that one, is the pilot's guide to skew tees. So those sounding uh, diagrams that Brian was showing earlier, there's a real in-depth sort of three-hour course that he does. Again, he charges for it. So I think it's 99 quid. But it's brilliant. Um, and you get lifetime access to it, so I need to go back and re-look re at that again. But um, I'll just show you. So this is the forecast. This morning, I will whisk through some of it because he does his little bit of advertisement. Um, is that coming through? It's not, is it? Hi everyone, Simon Keeling here with your flying weather outlook for the week and the weekend ahead. Brought to you exclusively by Flyer in association with weatherschool.co.uk. Thanks again for watching. And I suppose not a bad week this week, quite breezy for tomorrow. I think Wednesday looks wetter overall, particularly in northern and western areas. Thursday and Friday probably looking at some showers around, and then not a bad weekend. So there are some windows for flying in there. Spotting those weather windows is exactly what we do at Aviation. I mean, it goes through this sort of thing of I'll just move it on a bit. to see you yeah, afterwards. He always does about a minute on his uh... of the course. Now, also on a Friday, yes, I send out my free weekend forecast email. So if you're not getting that yet, this is where I can update you in a text format as to what the weather for flying at the weekend is going to be. You don't get any spam. You don't get any rubbish. Um, if you're not getting those forecasts yet, then just send the blank email to the address you see on the screen there, aviationweather-subscribe at weatherweb.net and I'll make sure that you start receiving them. Okay, so this is how Monday shapes up. Got the remnants of a front that's just moving its way eastwards on Monday morning, having been some rain across East Anglia and the southeast through much of the morning. However, many areas are going to become better. It is going to become flyable for most. 
Some cloud effect in western Scotland and western Ireland, a few spots of rain here, but generally it is going to be a fair day. Now for Tuesday, quite a strong southeast wind picking up during the course of Tuesday. Could be funny gusts of 25 knots for many, perhaps 30 to 35 knots across western parts of Wales, southwest England, western Scotland. Probably more cloud across northern and southern parts of Ireland, southwestern England, southwestern parts of Wales as well. Non there via here, with the bases lowering to less than a thousand feet, tops at twelve thousand feet. But elsewhere, despite that wind, it is going to be pretty good. We're looking at 4,000 foot bases, 8,000 foot tops, and generally fair until that rain arrives. Now, Wednesday, like I said in the intro, it looks like we do have a rain across Scotland, northern, central, southern parts of England during the day on Wednesday. Probably mainly non vfrable here. I think bases we're looking at 1,000 to 2,000 feet tops, 15 to 18,000 feet. So QNIMs running along the front that you see there so generally not very far but for east anglia for the southeast perhaps the eastern midlands very warm uh, fairly cloudy three to four thousand foot bases twelve thousand foot tops here morning better because the rain arrives there in the afternoon probably becoming marginally in western island later as the rain clears and is replaced by heavy showers now thursday is a bit of an uncertain one some area of cloud or rain or showers passing eastwards across southern England during the morning. Following in behind though is a VFR conditions. Bases around three to four thousand feet, tops of twelve to fifteen thousand feet. Those probably reduce it during the day. Quite a bit of cloud around. On to Friday, and again, it's bands of showers just moving from west to east on Friday. Most areas do look as if they are going to be flyable, just pretty marginal in those showers. But then later on, we get rain coming in from the west, and that brings non vfrable conditions to much of Ireland and eventually to much of the west of the UK. But early on looks better on Friday, apart from those showers. Saturday, not looking too bad, generally VFR. It looks like in the morning, timing on this could change, but generally three to 4,000 feet, tops about 10,000 feet, becoming non far in the west as these fronts move in. Base is 1,000 to 2,000 feet, 12 to 15,000 foot tops, so a general deterioration. And then through Sunday, generally fair, but some drizzle may affect western Scotland, but northern and western Ireland, but elsewhere it is going to be fair. Overall, could be some drizzle and low cloud for southern and western coasts and hills, but generally, like I say, it does look like being a reasonable sort of day. Okay, I will leave you that for now. Right, I'll finish that over. So yeah, so it just it just gives you a pretty good overview of what's probably going to happen during the week, and then it's off that that where I would then say, right, I need to look into this a bit more, a bit more detail, and uh, yeah, and look at the stuff that you've been. Going on about, you know, digging a bit deeper into like windy and things like that. Um, so I, I, I find that that is my real starting point on a, on a as I say, on a Monday morning, and then certainly then on a uh, Thursday. The other one as well is uh, Met Office. Now, the Met Office obviously is the official source of weather data for the UK, um, it's, it's government, um, you know, it's, it's a government department. And they, their, their services that they do are pretty good, but I think in the past people have, it's not been quite user friendly um, sort of look at the websites and things like that, but it's improved a lot um, recently and they, they, they've really changed it and I, I actually quite like it now. I don't look at BBC for that big picture of what's going to happen, I just, especially what happened last week, what was it? 15,000 miles an hour, a lot of data yeah. went wrong. But yeah, just for general uh, sort of forecasts, uh, the maps and the charts now, Jim was going to come here tonight and um, he was going to talk through some sort of the, uh, the Met Office charts. Um, but again, they're all, they're all on there. The app, I, I think it's brilliant now. It's, it's as graphically um, pleasing as any other app that you've got. Um, I think it's and it's, it appears more accurate. I, I look at weather every day and I, I actually sit there and look, is it is it doing what it said it was going to do? And, and I find it pretty good. Um, and then one that you mentioned, I managed to put it on there at the end. Um, they have a deep dive YouTube channel. So if you really want to geek out with weather, 
um, and really have a look into things. They, they explain everything, don't they? It's at the nth degree. Tuesdays, <coughs> Tuesdays about That's five o'clock. Deep dive. Yeah. Worth, worth looking for. It, it goes into fantastic detail and it covers the whole world as well. Yes, yeah, so it was quite right. interesting last week with all the um, the weather that was going on in the States and then it was showing what the effect of it would be later on in, as it is now. And it's just hit France, hasn't it, some of the remnants of those. So it was really, it was really quite interesting to do a bit of a deep dive in there. I'll just show you the, I mean, it's just like, uh, it's just like any other, let's put that, uh, So yeah, so you've basically got the weather. You think I've never done this before? Right. I'll have to close it now. It's actually the adverts on it, which you never used to in that office. But the same to be doing that now. But it gives you the weather for the week, just in a general form. But then it gives you all these parameters. And again, it's big picture. This this isn't, <coughs> this isn't going to be what's going on on the on the hill specifically. But it will just give you an overall general idea. I mean, importantly, wind speed, wind direction, gusts um, as well. And then you get things like, you know, uh, the humidity level. So you're going to see precipitation <coughs> as well in there. Uh, you know, 90%, you're pretty much sure that that's probably going to be uh, some drizzle or rain uh, coming through. And then they've got, uh, they have the old video forecast as well. And then you can then do a bit of a deeper dive into the maps. And you can go through hour by hour. Uh, they have rainfall, temperature, wind speed, average. So, see what it comes up with. Probably nothing there. Yeah. There we go. So, if you, uh, you, you gus, um, cloud cover. So, again, hopefully that'll come in. Yeah. Um, so, again, th this is just all like that big picture and just trying to get an idea of whether it's actually worth um, going out. The other thing with Met Office as well, let me just open this up a little bit. Yeah, they also do uh, aviation briefing service, um, which is, it's a subscription thing, but it's free. So you just register for a free account. Um, and what that is good for is metas and taps. Now, again, when we first uh, learned to fly, it was all about metas yeah. and taps, wasn't it? We didn't have things like rats or anything. But actually, they, they have some really good information on there. The only problem is with it is that it's all coded. So unless you know all the codes, it actually becomes quite difficult to... Um, difficult to translate, but there are other, I'll show you an app in a minute, that just decodes it all, um, and that I find brilliant. So as you go on, I, I don't know, you might talk about um, XC weather in, in a bit. I mean, you'll look at that and you'll say, oh, you know, XC weather, or what's it doing at Blackpool at the moment? You'll probably find that that's three hours old, maybe. I don't know how often it updates that, but pretty much the, the, uh, the taps are there and then it, it's you know they usually update it about every 10 to 30 minutes so it is current current data and the thing is with the taps as well they're actually produced by humans everything else is like the metas are generated whereas the taps are actually they take the data and then they actually do something with it so a human has actually had some involvement in it um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on is this as well. So this is, if this locks in. How do you uh, flick the 
zu eng an der Sprengung. So this is the aviation briefing service, and you can go into the TAFs and things like that, but I, I don't use that, uh, it for that. Um, you can do all your regional forecasts, uh, SIGMETs and, and things like that, so that's significant meteorological um, stuff. But I actually go into here. So first of all, you've got your surface pressure charts. I prefer it black and white. Oh, that's not worked, has it? Um, but yeah. Between these and skew T's, you can pretty much predict, you know, get a full on weather forecast. Um, I'm not going to go through this, Jim was going to do that and, uh, and go through it, but these are, um, this is the one for today from uh, 12, is that 14? Yeah. And then you can flick them along and you can see all the weather fronts passing through. So that would be Wednesday, yeah, so that's the Wednesday chart where. On that video, you were seeing that the fronts were passing through. Oops. And then, you know, and all the weather that's associated with those fronts. But the other one is, is this. So these, these, so you've got a low level forecast for the UK, um, and also spot winds. So the spot winds, I look at these, particularly when I go flying the plane, is these are, they, they basically get soundings, and these are the spot winds at level plus temperature. And it's just something, just a, a very quick look at to see what's actually happening. So you can see, sort of, this is up near Carlisle, and this is just west of Durham. So it covers, a, it covers a massive area, but you can sort of see there, so at 1,000 feet, it was saying 10 knot winds, 190 degrees, um, and then it then dropped down to five at 2,000 feet. And it stayed like that till five and then stepped back up again. And they, they only do one of these, I think it's about 7.30 in the morning they release this. And uh, yeah, but you can just get a quick idea of what the winds are actually doing. There has been days, and I remember Brian, I looked at it one day where people were going out flying and it was one of those days and I looked back at one where it was like, why were people flying? Something might have happened that day. And you know, and it showed you that it was like five uh, knots at 1,000 feet, and then it went to like 25 knots at 2,000 feet. And then, Jesus, the wind speed and the, the wind gradient there is massive, and then add the topography in it. And you, you, you know, you've got a, a particularly rough and a horrible day. So, so yeah, so that, that's another one that you can just click on. Um, just a snapshot, just by looking, you know, in our area, which is those two, you get an idea of what the wind speed's going to be on the day. Um, let me just go back to this. So yeah, so I mean, again, like I say, this is just sort of like the the big, big picture kind of weather uh, that I'm looking at. I mentioned about metals and tafts. So um, I don't use the Met Office one, but you can see you've got um, all the log. I just clicked on nearby today, took some screenshots. Um, it's available on iOS and Android, but you know you can go all the way. <coughs> it's global, to be honest, and it gives you the latest weather in um, at the, those airfields. So you know, for us, Black Blackpool and Walton are quite significant. You know, on a westerly day, you'll get a, an idea of what's going to be happening in that western bowl of, uh, of Parlock. Um, so you click on these, and then you get this broken down. So you've got your METAR there, which is, as I said earlier, is pretty much generated, um, whereas the TAF is actually a human being has then taken that some data and has then, um, you know, said what's coming up in the forecast as well. So. You know, and I, I was saying to Brian earlier that there's some days where, you know, pretty good today. You could look at that on Wednesday, and that taff will be about six, eight lines long. And when it's that long, just keep your glider in the back because it's just going to be sort of like, you know, the, the, the weather that's coming through is going to be quite significant. So you can always tell the longer the taff, the, the less you want to actually be up in the air. 
And then they, they do all these, it does all these uh, sort of wind direction uh, graphs as well, and uh, I think it's wind speed. Yeah, I don't often look at that, I'm just generally looking at, at this. Um, then another app that I use, and this is one really that um, I use when, you know, if you are stood on Parlock or you, you're out somewhere and you, can, you know that there's some weather coming through, um, this is brilliant. It, it does radar, but it, it also forecasts it as well. So, depending on the wind speed, the wind direction, and it'll show you, and it's pretty bloody accurate, I've found. You can almost go, oh, right, rain's going to hit in about 20 minutes. And you can click it along, and then all of a sudden the rain comes in, and it's it's really good. Now this is uh, home and dry, and it is only available on um, iPhones, unfortunately. Um, you can do that on the Met Office rain radar app. You can, well, though. yeah. And, was, and again, I think it's really accurate. Yeah, it it, it really is. How far does the Met Office one though forecast? Because this you can focus. Uh, all week. Does it? Does it? Yeah. Days, anyway, but yeah. I like the fact as well you can go back the last six hours. Mm. Yeah. So you can yeah. compare what's just happened yeah. with what it's forecasting. Mm. Yeah. To happen I, I, from I guess the neighbours now. Neighbor, now come to me and say, can I put the washing out? You know, yeah. and what time can I put <laughs> the washing out? I have that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, does, this, it, does it forecast it or does it just move the picture? Oh, well, I think it. I think it just moves the picture. It probably moves the picture, picture, but it doesn't it doesn't just stay. Mm. The shapes change. The shapes change. Oh, so there is there is That's something sat behind it. Moves so. the yeah, no. The shape yeah. definitely changes yeah. on it. But it, it. It still can't really deal with showers, can it? No. This this, this is no. great for, for, for meteorological weather, a weather front or something like that, you can see it sharp edge, but showers they can pop up anywhere yeah. and, and die away before they reach you. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, stood on, you know, if you stood on a pile looking, thinking, should I fly down now? If you just flick it up and go, yeah, I think I'm going to go. <laughs> and then uh, go and land before it comes in. Um, and then, yeah, I just picked up on this one. This was today, actually. Uh, there was this distinct bank of clouds sort of running from Southport all the way down, sort of uh, Nottingham. And I, I was just out for a walk at lunchtime, and I saw, and that was it there. Okay. Just shown straight across. Yeah. And you could see... That was coming in as I left the hill, so when I got home, it was telling me yeah. cast. Yeah. You, you guys were flying it. Yeah, yeah. 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 it must have come all in. Yeah, so it came. We, we sort of looked up and went, whoa, and we had no yeah, it happened. It was very, very yeah. quick. Yeah. So, so, yeah, just again, it's just a, a, another app that I found pretty good for, for rain, cloud, and, and various other bits. Um, right, final one. Um, Mountain Weather Information Service. Um, I'm surprised how many few people actually use this for going flying. You, yeah, sure? I always look at this if I'm going to the lakes. Yeah, so if you're going to the lakes, I mean, it, it covers 10 areas of, um, of the UK, obviously five in Scotland, and then five areas around, um, around England. And um, yeah, I always consult it, maybe not for the peaks, but all those other areas, definitely, definitely do it. And if you've ever seen, <coughs> I'll try and click on to it. Look at Lake District one. Now it's changed for Tuesday, so today, let's have a look. It's not showing up anymore. Okay. So you'll, if, you, if you're out to your outdoors, you'll have seen these uh, fastened to windows in outdoor shops. But basically it's the summit weather forecast for um, regions of the UK. And basically this is the Lake District one, and this is now showing for Tuesday. So I think around about six o'clock it changed from being Mondays, which looked a lovely day, to be fair. Um, you had really sort of light winds, five to ten mile an hour at summit levels and stuff like that. Um, whereas it's changed now to Tuesday. But overall, obviously gives you sort of just a general overview with uh, the pressure, uh, a bit like the Met Office chart. A general overview of the the weather um, across the mountain regions in the UK. But then it goes specifically 
into. You know, how windy will it be on the summit? And this is, I suppose this is really if you're walking. Um, but, you know, today would have been a nice day to be up in the lakes, whether there'd have been much activity thermal-wise, we'd have had a look at RASP. But this would just give you an idea. I wouldn't be going to the lakes tomorrow with that saying, you know, um, suddenly varied speed, typical 25 to 30 mile an hour, but near 40 in some areas. And, you know, and it says northern major summits. Um, you know, arduous conditions. So you're thinking, if that's a walk, what am I going to be like in my... Uh, a paraglider but I always look at this you know it says how wet drizzle mainly in the south lake so north lakes might be a little bit clearer uh, you know, feeling damp well there we go cloud on the hills um, sunshine so again you know there's, there's been days remember we've we've been up haven't we sat so when it's been pretty much nil wind and you just know that if you go up to the lakes and the sun uh, in the spring months and the sun's hitting the the hills and there's or rather the, the rocks you're going to get thermals even though this generally you might look at rasping it might suggest that there's no um there's not a great deal of thermic activity yeah. but because it's it's in rocks that i think the rasp underestimates the effect of the mountains it does the yeah on thermic it's, activity it's too it's too coarse a, a yeah. Yeah. structure it's yeah looking, it's looking at areas you know, about 10 kilometers yeah. square so yeah yeah because it's i think it's in the summer the, it can often be much more thermic than in the lakes mm. than RASP ever suggests. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. So, you know, if it's the same sort of five, ten mile an hour up here, it's bright sunshine, um, yeah, go up to the lakes and um, you'll likely get some thermic activity going up there. Um, and then he does then the days, two days going forward. And he, as I say, uh, about six o'clock every day it changes to the following day. And then it gives you a bit of a planning outlook for the, the rest. But I find that really useful. And um, I wouldn't generally fly the lakes, whether it's my paraglider or the plane, without looking at that. I'm actually looking at flying the plane over the lakes at weekend. So come Thursday, I'll be looking at this and hoping that it's the wind speed's uh, a lot longer than it's showing for, for these days. So, yeah. All right. So that was more of a sort of a bit of a bigger picture kind of thing of just how to really sort of look at um, do I even plan uh, that or do I actually go and do something with the family at the weekend. Uh, all right. Thank you. Very That's right. it. <laughs> so yes, we have major anticlimax and a totally different league to all the other stuff. Um, but I guess. From my perspective, it was what Andy was talking about, trying to balance what you're doing, trying to work out when you're going to skive off work or when you're going to do a family day or whatever. Um, XC weather is always my first port of call. It's really basic compared to the stuff we've been looking at before. But one of the things that I like about it is the wind map. So when you open the home page, that's all live data from weather stations around the country, well, live-ish. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, airports, the, on the west coast here near us, as Andy said before, uh, Wharton and Blackpool Airport are the two nearest stations. And from here you can hover over um, a station and it'll give you a reading, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so, XC Weather's been around for a long time. It was created 20 years ago by a paraglider pilot called Dave Billington. Um, the, the wind map there is most recent readings from weather stations, uh, usually at around 10 metres above ground level, and their observations are updated every 30 minutes. Yeah, but the most recent one isn't necessarily 30 minutes. To go, but there is a timestamp on that, so I find that quite useful to look at Blackpool Airport or look at Wharton and see what the wind speed is. And generally, I reckon if they're giving more than 10 mile an hour, the pilots won't have. Um, it uh, uses GFS and uh, 
one of the handy things on this map, I think, is, is the red arrows. So that's where the average wind speed and the gust was more than 10 knots difference. And generally, if the map's covered in red arrows, I don't even think about that going on. Or, or if the forecast map is showing that. Um, So that's, if you hover over one of the uh, icons on the map, or depending on what it is, if it's in a phone or a laptop, sometimes you need to click on it, it will. So that's Blackpool Airport, and at the point where I did this, it was 12 mile an hour northeast, but you can, uh, what I also like is the wind history. So you can see at half an hour intervals, the difference 13 mile an hour, 14, 12. And in the summer, our, often on Pollock, our classic evening flying um, sea breeze evenings are where it's been too windy during the day. So it's blown out westerly, and a lot of us will turn up at Pollock about six o'clock and go and fly for a few hours before sunset. And what you can do from this is, is look at Blackpool Airport or Wharton and you can see that the wind speed's dropping during the day. So often it'll be like 14, 15 mile an hour. And uh, the forecast might be, so you've got the forecast for Blackpool Airport there as well. I often just put chip in Preston or chip in Lancashire and then get the forecast for Barley. But for working out an icy breeze evening, um, it's been too windy during the day generally, but you look at the forecast and sort of six, seven o'clock it's dropping to seven, eight mile an hour. And often we'll go, well, Lee knows you've done it with us a few times, haven't you? Go and fly Parley for a few hours in the evening in the summer. Um, one of the things that I would say with um, with the forecast on here, <coughs> is you need to adjust for the wind speed you need on the hill. So if it's much more than 9 or 10 mile an hour on, on the forecast on the XC weather, then I reckon it's blown out. And uh, so on this forecast here, 6, 7 mile an hour, um, yeah, that was, that was yesterday's forecast. Uh, yeah, yesterday's forecast. So it, in the morning, the initial forecast. Uh, oh no, yeah, that's that's today, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was looking at that for today as well. So uh, I was trying to scribe out of work this afternoon, and I figured that it probably wasn't worth going out in the morning, but this afternoon might have been okay. And then it got it dropping off as the day. Later into the evening, which I think it did, did it? Guys, it was flying far Yeah, it did. Um, but yesterday's forecast was really light winds in the morning, and then a two hour slot in the afternoon, sort of six, seven mile an hour westerly, and then dropping off to nothing again, which is what it did pretty much. I mean, look, a lot of pilots don't even look at XE where they think it's what's it? Oh, that's <laughs> you can um, you can change a lot of these columns as well. So cloud base, cloud cover, pressure, they're selectable in the settings. Um, really, this for me, this is just a starting point. I'll look at this, and if it looks like I'll look on the, the week's forecast, and if it looks like there's one day that stands out to me, then I'll start looking at everything else. Look at RAS, look at uh, Met Office charts. Um, if we're talking about the lakes, then the mountain weather survey. Um, but before I even start bothering with all of that, I'll always look at XC weather. And I can't think of any days where this is suggested to me it was blown out and then it's been flyable. And as long as you, you adjust what wind speed you're looking at, I think it gives a pretty good indication. Certainly, it's, it's fairly accurate for direction. It's not so great for uh, the other elements. So, 
uh, precipitation and cloud cover aren't amazing on it. But I think I think wind speed and direction can be pretty accurate. Um, Are you looking at um, the browser version when you're talking? So yeah, but even if I'm on my phone, I'll yeah. I'll I'll ignore the mobile version on the phone because yeah. it's a bit crap, yeah. and I'll still use the browser version. Yeah. Um, but the I I really find that useful, and the so if it's a blown out day, but I'm thinking it might get flyable in the evening or later on, then I'll be constantly looking at the wind history at Blackpool Airport or at Wharton and looking for that consistently dropping. And if you can see that like 14, 16, 12, 10, as the afternoon goes on, then I start looking at going out to Barwick after work, getting there for about 6 o'clock and often it will be flyable in the summer on the west. Um, like I said, after all the other stuff we've talked about, this is about as basic as it gets. But I just find it useful. If I, if I look at this and I think there's no chance, I don't even waste my time looking at anything else. But then I'll... Uh, if it looks like a, a possible day, like today did, I'll start trying to work out how I can skive out of work. And, they, and it worked this afternoon, I mean, we played. It wasn't exactly nice, yeah. but... Uh, <laughs> Should have looked into it in a bit more detail. <laughs> well, no, actually, that's the other thing, is I'll look at this first, and then the next thing I'll do is look at Neil's app for the wind, wind altitude, because this might suggest it looks all right, and then you look at the app, and at two and a half thousand feet is by a bloody gale. You can do that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but today it looked all right, so... It did. It was dropping with height today, I think. Yeah. Mm. So this is actually uh, live on XC weather now. I mean, from Pali, these two stations are only about 20, 25 k away. Mm. So I think they're pretty relevant to yeah, what's that, happening on they, the hill. It's what we always used to use, wasn't it? Well, yeah, that was before all this, all this stuff <coughs> yeah, existed. Yeah. It was, it was and, really and this is really basic, but uh, as I say, for me, the main thing is I it avoids me wasting time getting in deep into anything else. I'll look at this and go, Right, like, like the forecast there for for Blackpool. Just on that distance, Simon, is where it's on preempted a bit, but um, this is based on GFS. Yeah. As a forecast. And yeah. GFS and it's uh, I've lost it in my notes now, but I think it's a twenty-seven k. Exactly what I was about to say. Um, so if you look at the site, yeah. You're picking us, picking within 27 kilometres square yeah. tiles. Yeah. So it's not high resolution, no. and it doesn't take into account for uh, terrain either, and uh, it doesn't really do. I mean, it does. It does to an extent forecast sea breeze, but it's not particularly accurate for it. Um, Just go for the for the live comparison of going. Oh, it's 10k away. You're like, well, the whole forecast. Yeah, it's nearly yeah, 30k yeah. squares. It's, yeah. Do you remember what a fantastic upgrade that was compared to the BBC weather forecast? Well, to everything we had. When Dave yeah. made this, there wasn't really anything. There wasn't in, it anything well, like as wind as this. Uh, but the, my main point really is I'll look at the week, and if it all looks like that, I don't even waste the time looking at anything else. What was the weather station when you used to telephone? Windy, 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 wind
uh, and like either from Derbyshire and he put weather stations up on some of the hills and you could subscribe to that and you would phone it up, put a code in and it would tell you what the wind speed and direction was at that, at that station at that point. And there used to be one on Longridge, so we'd phone Wendy up. But then you had to add... Didn't you? Yeah, probably, probably like similar to this, almost More. half in it really. Yeah. So if it said 10 mile an hour, it was probably five. If yeah. it said 20 mile an hour, forget it. Yeah. But it, it, gave you, it, like, it gave you gusts as well, and, and, and Rod used to talk about a formula that converted the difference between the wind speed and the gust speed, and that would give you the thermal strength. And he also gave a calculation of cloud base based on the temperature differences overnight. Yeah, I'm not sure how. No, it was. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, for, for me, the main thing with this is you want to be halving the wind speeds, really. Uh, so, six to eight mile an hour, I would say that's probably viable. But 10 to 22 or like Thursday, according to this, that's maybe doable on Parlick. So, is that what you're doing? You're looking at wind and gusts and halving? Uh, yeah, for things like this, yeah. Uh, so if, if, if this is giving the average wind speed at 20 mile an hour, then there's not open hell. But that's giving the average wind speed on Parlick, well, chipping on Thursday at uh, 6 mile an hour, Guston Twain. So that's maybe, probably okay. If that was 8, 9 mile an hour, then it's certainly boardwalk. And I did the same thing today, really. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm I, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at, yeah, it, it's half what you would probably get on the hill. It's, it's showing half. Yeah. 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 Uh, that, that's kind of my cut-off. If it's showing double figures in miles per hour on Met Office or Windy, yeah. it's got kind of copyright. Yeah, I think I think most of these. Sorry, if you took your cloud basin as well, there's where it looks viable wind wise, but you've got cloud at a five hundred feet all day. Yeah, I'm not sure the cloud base. Uh, I've lost that. I normally have that. Yeah, I don't know why. Why I've lost that? Uh, I'm not sure that the cloud base forecast on this is that accurate, to be honest. I mean, if it is, if it's forecasting less than a thousand foot, then it's probably going to be cloud in. But it doesn't seem to ever get very high. Even in the summer, on a good day, it's still saying like fifteen feet or two thousand feet. The main thing that I use this for <coughs> is wind speed and direction. I think a lot of the other stuff on it really isn't that reliable, and I think it probably comes down to the resolution. Um, but it is simply for me, it's just, right, I'm going to start looking at Thursday in more detail and it might be worth trying to skype out of work, or the whole week looks howling and pissing down, I'm not even going to bother. It's worth saying for today as well, because I, I use Windfinder, but it's the same forecast. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, and... Um, um, yeah. I was going to say, um, it undercooks the gusts for me. So, Met Office today had it gusting 22, 23k's when you flew. Yeah. And this had it gusting 15 or 16k's, and it was it definitely had the Yeah, very strong. It has a, a bit of a tendency to undercook mm -hmm. the gusts, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's just a starting point. I use all this other stuff that we've talked about before. But I start with this and I look at this all the time just to see if there's a, it looks like there might be a day coming up. And it, what it seems to do well is, is long distance. So four or five days away, this will often forecast a flyable day that then a couple of days later will disappear. But then when it comes closer to the actual day, this will go back to a similar forecast that it had been at the start of the week. And... Uh, I kind of work out which day I'm going to try and get out of work using this on a Sunday night, and often it works for me. 
it's a conspiracy though, Simon. They all give fo good forecasts for the weekend. Yeah. Uh, no, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just so that people book holidays and buy yeah. ice cream. Yeah. And then, then when the weather's crap. But what you often see on this is a couple of days will be forecasting a flyable day, two or three days, and then it'll disappear for a day, and then it'll come back, and the two or three days before it looks consistent, and often it does, it does pan out. And I'll, I'll kind of pick a day from this on a Sunday to have off work, even Thursday or Friday, and quite often it works. But it's, it's accepting that you, the, you're looking for wind speeds way less than what you would actually fly in. So, you know, you might be willing to fly an 18 mile an hour, but if this says 18 mile an hour, then it's definitely blown out. Yeah, these are ground level, low level wind speeds, aren't they? I think all of these ground level forecasts, you want to be looking for less than 10 mile an hour really, yeah. on any of these sites. Um, like I say, basic, nothing like all the other stuff we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, but there are some useful elements like the live weather map. And it's quite interesting. You often see Warcop and Sharp massive gusts. It surprised me recently. I've I've known that people are flying Carrick, and I've seen gusts of Warcop like 27, 30 mile an hour. But that kind of Carrick's got that weird waving thing going on. Uh, forecast map is quite handy as well to look at an overview of what it's doing during the day, whether it's going to pick up as the day goes on. And I say, generally, if I see red arrows on this, I'll have it in the bottom. Do, the, do you ever use this? I mean, the experienced pilots to me use it, actually, well, or is it just me? <laughs> no, I, 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 I use them all. You know, I will look at them all. Um, I'm pretty much the same as you, Simon. I use that and I look at the ears. Yeah. So I always start with this because I think if this is saying it's blown out, quick and easy to look at. I, I, I can't remember there ever being a day when I've looked at this and it's told me it's blown out but then it's been flyable. So if I start with this, if it looks blown out, I don't waste my time looking at anything else. Yeah. And then if there's a day that stands out on this as, as possible, then I'll start looking much deeper, looking at charts, looking at RASP, looking at wind altitude. Um, but it's just a nice, quick, handy reference, really. And I do think that the, the live weather data is handy as well. Especially looking at trends. Uh, in the summer, I try and get out to Parlick after work. Um, the kind of sea breeze evenings, they always start out blown out. So I'm watching during the afternoon I'm watching the wind history to see if it's consistently dropping and if it is then I'll get to the hill for six o'clock and often it's still blown out then but by the time the walk up it's liable. Uh, stand there and there's something to take off first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah play, play, play the uh, uh, Getting ready games, see who can be the slowest yeah. freaking old. <laughs> How do you get the history of what's, what's happening? So, hovering over a station yeah. gives you the last three readings. So you can see oh, it, obviously, 1950, it was six mile an hour, six mile an hour, eight mile an hour. But during the day in the summer, you can see that because the, the sea breeze is. Is backing off and the wind's dropping as the evening comes in. You can see that dropping really pronounced. But you only get three hours. Yeah. But I tend to watch it through the afternoon, so mm -hmm. I'm watching from like two, three o'clock and seeing that it was 18 mile an hour, was 14 mile an hour, it's now at 12 mile an hour. Yeah. So you just say, yeah. Uh, you get there when it's zero. The forecast map, I'll often look at that on an XC day to look and see whether 
as you get downwind, the wind's increasing, or as the day goes on, the wind's picking up. Uh, weather, I don't really trust on here. I would, I would never use this just to decide on going flying, but I think it's a handy tool to start off with. You say you use it, Jeff. Yeah. Quick and easy, very quick. I think that's the benefit of it, isn't it? It's quick and easy. It shows you all the, yeah. all the, the arrows on the page. Maybe we should have done this the other way around. Yeah. Your overview. Yeah. I, I was conscious that mine might have was asleep if we got to, we'd have to do it. <laughs> but I didn't see the earlier things, but I assume the earlier things were better for if you were thinking of going to the legs. No, they were they, they were they were general things for um, how to you how to use rasp and things like that. It was um, but getting into in, into sort of looking in fine detail. So we started with the detail, we're going more broad. Uh, Andy did talk about the amount of weather service. Yeah, I'll yeah. always look at that if I'm going to the lakes. I think I can show a much better picture of what's happening on the felt tops than yeah. any of the other forecasts. Yeah, because it is a felt top forecast, so yeah. Is there no more stations over this side, like Shack and Dales and stuff like that? Well, there are actual weather stations. Yeah, ones, yeah. yeah. So the Dales have got three, I think, or is two? There's there's one on Weatherfell and the Shack in the Dales. I just wondered whether any of this side. We don't have any around here. Yeah. Um, no, there was just Wendy Winkles, wasn't there? Wendy on Longridge. Yeah. And it was never reliable. Never, it never gave you the, right, the information you needed for places like Parwick. No, I mean, you, you had to do the same as this with it, really. If it said 10 mile an hour, then it might just about be okay. But if it said 20 mile an hour, it was howling. Um, there were some weather stations on Weather Underground, I guess there still are, but there's one in Chipping, but it's down in a valley and it's not yeah. really much use for yeah. anything. Right. If you're over non-sway, there's one on Home Moss that's quite useful. There's a Manchester academic one up there that I don't think it feeds through to these. It's, you have to look it up on their, their website. Right. Um, yeah. But that's a good one and it's right up on the tennis mm -hmm. so it, Um, any questions, anybody? Like well, I say, it is basic this, but uh, I just start with this. Well, thanks, Simon. That's been really useful. I mean, it, it is, it is important to have a starting point in some way that gives you a, an overview of the week ahead, and it, you, know, you can spot possibilities. I find it's quite useful for coastal sites as well, mm -hmm. and you don't need to adjust the wind speed too much for coastal sites. It's always back on, I think. Yeah. Also, yeah. Um, yeah, so if we're looking at Sarncroft or something, if it says 18 mile an hour, then it's probably okay at Sarncroft. So it's off to the south. Yeah. <laughs> In which case, don't, don't <laughs> bother. Yeah, well, we'll not try it. <laughs> Why? What happens then? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll just get an entry in, a, in the sky wings, are <laughs> Nice afternoon visit to the neighbourhood hospital. Well, one good thing I found out that Kendall Hospital was uh, pretty good. Mm. <laughs> yeah, if you've got a choice of hospitals, go to Westmoreland. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thanks, Simon. Is someone else doing... And is that it? Neil? 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 Do you want to do five? Don't mind how we do for time. If you do oh. like five, I can... It's only half past nine. Five. Yeah. 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 If you like. Yeah, good. Five minutes. No, you're going to stand there and talk about it. Yeah, I'll happily do it with that. I'll do the answer. It's a big tent. Mark on the board. Just draw that chart. Shall I roll the tech in? I'll do the tech in. Just a web browser. It's only just a No, I did. 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 I did.
is probably worth a quick chat for anyone who doesn't know. So there was a day on Parlick last year where it, it really caught me because I was going to go out. Um, you know, and it looked, you look at your XC weather forecast and kind of go, oh, that looks great. And I'd, I'd done that and, and looked at the Met Office. You know, that looks cool. Yeah, let's go. And a few guys had gone. And then before I left in the car, Phil Woolbank posted on the, the chat telegram going, has anybody checked the wind altitude forecast? And I looked at it and just went, oh, shit, I'm not going. And one of the guys on the hill got hurt, and everybody else had a roller coaster. And it was because um, when we bring this chart up now, has everyone seen this, by the way? Before I dwell on it too much, you, you've all no. Some of the new guys. Okay. okay. So we'll drop the link on again, but you can look up any site in the country because it knows the sites. Um, it might take a sec to load on the pub Wi-Fi, and it's going to show us now today. So you can um, can't close this up a bit more. I'm trying to make it look like it does on a phone because it's really designed. Oh, I'm scared of someone else's laptop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the idea was to go um, on these, these forecasts that you can get, um, and we talked about the expensive data, and, and all, they all publish some for free, and you can get it through a site called Open Meteo, so I started going looking for the, the data, and drew a chart that looked a bit like this to try and work out what had happened on the day that Francis hurt himself. And this is, so this is wind speed. Further to the right, more wind. Um, you'll see it kind of shift. So as it goes up to 100 miles an hour, and it's really windy, the, the whole chart shifts left. Um, but more wind that way, more height that way. It's got the takeoff marked of wherever it is that you're flying. So it's an easy kind of reference. And on the day we had the accident and everybody got a roller coaster ride, it went fine, sort of 10 kilometers an hour, a little bit more. 35 kilometers an hour, just above takeoff, and it, it was really, really obvious that just below takeoff, you'd be sat on the hill going, it feels all right, when the forecast said it was all right, it feels good. And it was blue as well, so you couldn't see the clouds racing past above your head. And literally a hundred, couple of hundred feet above the hill, it was howling. And the mixing layer between those two levels isn't gonna be fun at all. So that's why I built this thing, kind of we were chatting and going, what happened on that day? I drew this chart, and hang on, we can just make this into an app and make it a thing that, that is usable. Um, it is getting used, by the way. I just, I hadn't checked until, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was looking for you down there, so we were chatting a second ago. 20,000 visits this year, isn't that? Which mm -hmm. is not quite legal. Um, Most to those of me. But yeah, you can, so you can check, you can dial up, and there's two ways to look at it. You can dial up a specific time and a day, um, on a week ahead and you can kind of go, what does tomorrow look like? And it goes, just no, at any level. Um, but when you look, oh, sorry, I'll tell you, and then the last one, this will take a while to calculate, you can get a three-day overview, um, and I'm, I'm making some changes now to make this faster, but the three-day overview is quite slow to load. Um, and this gives you, let's just spread it out, because it doesn't know the screen size. Um, it's trying to give you a summary of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, 
and then what's it going to feel like up, when you when you pull the height data for wind you you don't get any height you want it gives you various heights and it actually gives you pressure levels that I'll talk about in a minute so it gives it to you in hectopascals of pressure and it's converted back to height but the app's trying to do its best to say at whatever forecast point I've got just below takeoff so kind of walking up the hill height what's it going to feel like the next step it's got above takeoff so you're getting the dividing line and then at height whatever that is so somewhere around two and a half three grand it'll give you the thing so you can kind of get a quick eyeball of direction with the arrows and how strong it's going to be so you can see them on the chart. Um, well, that's, the thing you're that's that's everything you can get at the heights that we're at. So um, you can get what one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to about three, three and a half. You'll see these change, um, and it's kind of worth chatting about that. So depending on the pressure, and I'm going to get it the wrong way around, so I'm not going to try. These will go higher and lower as altitudes. So the, the pressure isn't changing. The forecast is telling the app. But then it's calculating that at so and so hectopascals of pressure, that means today this height. And I think. Now at 850, I think it's for 750 ish. Yeah, yeah, they're in 100 yeah. steps all That's the way up. It, yeah. I think this is the only app I've seen that does that. It was one of the reasons for building it. So when you, when you slide the slider on Windy and it says 330 metres or 1,000 metres, that's a rough average. And if the pressure on the day is significantly different to kind of normal, that can be way off. Whereas this is the actual calculated altitude for the pressure in that hour. That's, that's, that's the where the, um, the two axes on the meteogram axis, where you've got the height, the height <coughs> is fixed, but the pressure altitudes will then slide up and down according to what the pressure is on the day. That's it. And, and actually for the meteogram, the other reason for drawing this was, was that point that you made, Brian, the bit of the meteogram you really want is that bottom right hand corner bit, you kind of want somebody to blow it up. Yeah. So that was the aim. We've also talked about, you know, again earlier this evening, kind of going, well, would you put more on this? I'd be really interested if anybody wants to chat about it. I've been asked for cloud cover, we've talked about temperature, and I just go, it, it suddenly is heading for what RASP yeah. does, and RASP yeah. does what RASP does, so I'm trying to keep we, it we, as simple as possible. We've got to do all of that other stuff. That's the point of this is, it's is just a quick reference of window altitude, because what I found before you did this, although the data is out there, it's really not easy to find it. Or, it yeah. or not easy to see, I think, yeah. you have to sit yeah. there sliding sliders and yeah. remembering and, what and you saw. And then it's not always showing you what you want to see, and on some of the websites, it's almost impossible to work it out. Yeah. Where this is just so quick, you've got wind direction and then speed at various altitudes and a big red line saying, no, I don't bother. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to get, by the way, you can change the settings if you like miles an hour and stuff, so it has got a settings button. Just one thing, it won't stick in miles per hour for me. I keep on having to change it. So if, far. thank you, because I was always going to tell you that and I forgot. Um, if you change anything, so if you dial up Parlick and change the settings to miles an hour, and if you want, you can change it what colour it goes red. If you a windy person who likes flying in wind, you can change that, or a hanging pilot. Um, if you now bookmark it, it will remember, because up in the address bar, it's changing. So it will remember, and then it will go straight back to Parlick with miles an hour. Yeah. You have to bookmark it. If you just load it straight again, then no, it won't. Because right. mine, I've got mine set miles an hour, and it's always in miles an hour. It never it would be you're back. going back to a bookmark yeah. when you set it, then, because it, it defaults to case, um, but it will remember if you bookmark it. Um, last little thing, so really, we just talked about the 27k grid. So building this was was an education, to be honest, because I found out a whole load of stuff I didn't know. You start going, well, how hard can it be? And then suddenly you hit. The forecast don't do altitude wind speeds, they do pressure altitudes, and it's kind of, oh shit, I have to learn about those now. And the biggest thing, so there's a couple of forecasts on here as well, you can get ICON or GFS, so GFS is the one that powers XC Weather and Wind Finder and lots yeah. of other stuff. And on something like Windy, you'll see other choices, like ICON, um, ECMWF, the big ones. Um, Met Office doesn't appear on anything else, Met Office is just Met Office. And you kind of go, well, what's the difference? 
And the difference, I'll send some slides if anyone's interested and not, not kind of go through it, but GFS is 27k squared, big fat squares, and when you say what's the wind speed, it calculates the ground level and it does it afterwards. So it's an atmosphere model that has no concept of the GFS literally has no concept that there is a ground. It, it's an atmosphere model. And when you, so you, you pick a spot, you go parlic, and it goes, all right, what grid square is that in? So you immediately get a 27 kilometer average grid square. And then it goes, what's the height of the ground at parlic? And it gives you a 27k square average height and tells you what the wind speed is at that height. That's how XC Weather works, and that's how Windfinder works, and all the other GFS ones work. Which is why, so when I was doing it, I was checking it with Phil Warbank, because he knows everything about this stuff. And um, we were bouncing questions back and forth, and he suddenly went, that's why XC Weather always says it's windier in the Dales. Yeah, it's not windier. If you're stood on a hill that's the same height as Parlick, it's the same, but the average ground level is higher. So when you ask XC weather for the Dales, you'll get a windier forecast, even though when you're actually stood on top of the hill, it doesn't make any difference. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And same, so Parlick is surrounded by flatland. And actually, I had some weird results where the edge of the grid square is somewhere on the Parlick massive. Yeah. And I never quite worked out where it was. But Parlick takeoff includes all the flatland out to the sea, if you ask. Just over the back, <coughs> settle kind way includes the big pilot high ground massive that's behind and the average level is way way higher and you get forecast higher wind speeds and I was clicking this thing when I was building this there's something wrong with this and it wasn't it was just the forecast models resetting the height so you get the same for pendle pendles usually forecast a little bit windier on a simple forecast and it's because ground is higher so that's kind of worth bearing in mind and then when you see last little point is um, so icon is a more granular forecast much more zoomed in, it's like 2 or 5k or something like that, and so is ECMWF. So from the reading I had at least, ICON I use because it gives me the wind altitude ECMWF, it doesn't give me the data I need, so I use ICON. But, um, oh, I forget which site it was, one of, one of the sites reckons ECMWF is the most advanced model, um, European model, but you can't haul as much data out of it for free, so I don't use it. Icon is kind of next, and then GFS is really quite old now. Um, and some of what you get is things like um, all of them, or the, the more advanced ones, the ECMWFs and things, do start taking the ground into account. So not micro level, like the, the flow around Parlick, but they talk about the Rhine Valley and stuff, so the big like valley winds in Germany and so they, they do get those whereas GFS doesn't even get those because as far as GFS is concerned there is no ground until you ask what height um, the ground the average ground was at so that's it but plug away and let me know because I'm going to spend a few winter nights kind of jiggling with it and changing it and making it do new stuff so say if, you, if you're frustrated it will do something then let me know thank you very much indeed thank you, thank you. that's been good thank you